If we calculate or estimate the speed of this animal, it was probably moving along at at least uh, 11 kilometers, something like six or seven miles per hour, which, which is, a, is a pretty good uh, clip. It would be a jog for a, a human being. The movements of modern birds can also shed light on how dinosaurs traveled. Jim Farlow studies Australian emus and their similarities to T. rex. It would be nice to know what Tyrannosaurus was like as a living animal, but it's very inconveniently extinct. And if you want to get a picture of how it moved, what it might have been like when it was alive, it's helpful to look at modern animals that give us an approximation to something like Tyrannosaurus. And of such modern animals, I think the emu is about as good a model as one could hope to find. I suspect it's probably faster than Tyrannosaurus was. An, an emu in the wild can go, what, uh, 50, maybe 60 kilometers an hour. Tyrannosaurus, obviously, we've no direct way of, of determining how fast it could go. But based on the calculations of the strength of its bones relative to the size of the animal, I would think that a, at a good ballpark figure for the top speed of Tyrannosaurus might be something on the order of 30, 40 kilometers per hour. If you look at the way this emu walks, the way it puts its feet one in front of the other, it's a striding walker. It doesn't hop like a kangaroo. And if you look at the way it picks up its feet as it goes, I think this is about as close to a Tyrannosaurus as we can find in our modern world. And that's part of the fascination that emus have for me. But emus and other modern birds without tails may not provide a completely accurate model. Other scientists pursue a more distant cousin. The animal I have here, and the reason I think crocodilians are worth spending a lot of time looking at, um, this is a saltwater crocodile, and it retains many of the features that we think the primitive dinosaur ancestor might have had. We know that birds and crocodilians are dinosaurs' closest living relatives, and so they're the logical place to look for information on how T. rex worked. The muscle that I've spent a lot of time looking at uh, originates from the side of the tail. As you can see, crocodilians have a long, heavy, muscular tail. And along here where my fingers are is a large muscle that runs forward to attach onto the thigh bone, the femur. What we see in modern birds is that the tail itself has been reduced dramatically. Most of what we see in a bird tail is actually just feathers rather than muscle and bone. X-ray films prove that the presence or absence of a tail is a vital factor in the movement of an animal, be it bird, crocodilian, or dinosaur. What we're seeing in the X-ray films is that crocodilians and birds have very distinctive ways of moving their legs. The question was, which of those patterns can we apply back to a dinosaur like Tyrannosaurus. Birds use a lot of knee movement. The hip is very, very stable, uh, whereas in crocodilians, they're using lots of hip movement, and that seems to be driven by this muscle running from the tail to the thigh bone. Fortunately for this muscle, there's a very distinct scar, a bony attachment on the thigh bone that we can see in fossils like in T. rex, suggesting that that muscle existed and probably was working in similar way in these forms. What I'm suggesting is that in Tyrannosaurus, we have a unique combination of features. A tail that's more similar to what we see in crocodilians, and yet a bird-like lower limb. So a bird knee, a bird ankle, and a bird foot with a kind of crocodilian hips. And so in Tyrannosaurus rex, I'm predicting then we would have a unique combination of features working in a way unlike any other living animal today. T. rex was huge and its tail enormous, but it not only had to move, it had to mate. Again, modern crocodiles may offer us a glimpse of the mechanics of T. rex sex.
The examples of modern reptiles and birds, and a few rare fossils, suggest that T. rex was a nesting animal and laid eggs. I have in front of me some dinosaur eggs from China, and these are very elongated, kind of the shape that we would expect for Tyrannosaurus rex. To give you a feel for its size, I have here a chicken egg. But what's really exciting and very rare is this clutch of eggs here, which are very badly crushed, but we do have an embryo that's lying here. We can see the eye socket, the skull, the backbone in here, the pelvis, the hind leg. This embryo is about the size that we would expect for a Tyrannosaurus rex. We can imagine this hatchling coming out of the egg and scurrying off into the underbrush, or possibly if there was parental care, it may have scurried off and joined its parents. Sixty-five million years ago, the Earth was ruled by the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs were ruled by Tyrannosaurus rex, a hunter fast enough, big enough, powerful enough to catch and consume any prey. But one paleontologist dares to suggest T. rex was not a killer, but a scavenger, a giant marauding vulture. There's a controversy right now, um, of which I seem to be the... <clears throat> to be one side of, and almost everyone else in paleontology seems to be at the other side of. And this has to do with Tyrannosaurus rex being a predator or a scavenger. A predator, we have to remember, is, is actually a hunter, and a scavenger is the kind of animal that only eats dead things. We, we look down upon scavenging. Tyrannosaurus rex, we hate to think about Tyrannosaurus rex as a scavenger. We'd rather think of it as a predator. Its name, the Tyrant Lizard King. You can't have a king that's a scavenger. A hunter should have big eyes. It should have good eyesight. And if we look at the brain case, or if we look at, at, at uh, a T-Rex, the biggest lobe of the brain, the actual big openings in the brain, are for the sense of smell. And, and because, because we, we, can, we can actually carve out the area where the brain was, we can CAT scan it, we can do all sorts of things to it, we actually can make a model of what the brain would look like. We see the <clears throat> optic lobe is right here. It's very small. And the olfactory lobe is this huge thing at the front end of the brain. This is huge. This, is, this means that Tyrannosaurus had a very, very, very good sense of smell and not very good eyesight. This is contradictory to a hunter. This is what scavengers have. Horner's scavenger theory is disputed by Phil Curry a stalwart defender of T. rex the hunter. The skull of Tyrannosaurus is very narrow in the snout region, which allows the eyes to face forward, giving it stereoscopic vision. In addition to that, the ears themselves um, are located in such a way that they should be able to pick up sounds in particular directions. Uh, the ears may not look uh, very different from the other carnivorous dinosaurs externally, but internally there are a lot of changes that have taken place. This gives Tyrannosaurus rex a greater range of hearing capabilities, that is the frequencies that it could hear were lower than what most other dinosaurs could. Since Tyrannosaurus was probably hunting other dinosaurs, which were animals that probably made low sounds, 
the changes in the air would allow it to hear those animals better and to hunt them down. of the tyrannosaur is advantageous for a scavenger. The bigger you are, the better chance you have of chasing away another animal that may have made a kill. Even the short little arms, a T-Rex doesn't have anything for grabbing. And we're bipedal. We know that if we're going to go out and catch a chicken, we, want, we don't want to have our hands tied behind us. All of the features that we see all suggest that Tyrannosaurus and the Tyrannosaurs in general or scavengers. in the jaws of Tyrannosaurus rex, I have little doubt about its predatory capabilities. These are jaws that are meant to do some pretty nasty work. Like other carnivorous animals, Tyrannosaurus rex has teeth that are curved backwards. And at the same time, the tips of the teeth, in fact, curve towards the center of the mouth as well. What this means is that these teeth are specialized in such a way that if the prey is in the mouth and is struggling, uh, the only way for it to escape, really, is to go back further into the throat. Because tyrannosaur teeth are so tall, they have to have a very deep root. And this gives them uh, the strength so that the tooth is unlikely to break and also has the strength to puncture right through bone. And uh, this is the reason the tyrannosaur jaws are so deep. Um, almost two-thirds the length of the tooth is, in fact, root. There are these very fine serrations that run down the front of the tooth and the back of the tooth. These serrations function as little hooks. And as the tooth is driven through the meat, the hooks hook the fibers of meat and take it between the serrations. And between the serrations, you have razor-sharp edges that cut those fibers. Now, if we shift to the inside of the jaw, we can see that there are some very powerful muscle attachments here, going from the top down through this region. And this gives a muscle mass that fills in this whole area. These muscles allow the animal to close its jaws on very large animals and deliver a powerful bite very rapidly. And it would have no trouble at all cutting an animal such as myself in half in one single bite. We can say that Tyrannosaurus basically had a mouthful of steak knives. And if you have a mouthful of steak knives, obviously you eat steak, which is meat. We know that Tyrannosaurus ate meat. We know that they ate dinosaurs because we have evidence. This is a, a piece of a, a fibula, a shin bone from a duckbill dinosaur. And this shin bone actually has gouges, tooth marks from from being bitten by a tyrannosaur. And what's really interesting, it has a puncture mark in it. And in that puncture mark within the bone is actually the tip of a tyrannosaur tooth. So this is absolute proof that tyrannosaurs ate meat, that they ate other dinosaurs. But what it is not is evidence that the tyrannosaur killed this particular animal. But Ken Carpenter's forensic examination of another duckbill provides more compelling evidence that T. rex was a powerful, if not always successful, predator. I've been involved in a bit of detective work with the skeleton, mostly centered around the damaged area in this part of the tail. If we look here, we'll see that part of this uh, spine is missing. And it turns out that there's a very nice groove here that if I were to take a Tyrannosaurus tooth, we find that it fits very well in that groove. 